welcome to the new episode of pi for thought by in the indian journal of projects infrastructure and energy law today we are joined by dr alexandra harrington who is an international jurist in environmental and climate change law as well as human rights um dr harrington would you like to address the people who would be tuning in absolutely so i would just like to say a huge welcome and also thank you to everyone who is joining us today or whenever you're watching this day or evening um and also just to add in that um my latest post is actually in the uk um and so my current uh, late updated post is as uh, a lecturer in environmental and international law at uh, lancaster university so um hopefully we will be bridging these uh, points between the two but um as i have mentioned to the amazing editorial staff of the journal who've been incredible in working with me throughout all of the uh, the blog and now this um if they have any questions and certainly if you as audience members have any questions please feel free at any time to ask um, i'm hoping this is very much a, a beginning discussion but it, please if anyone does have questions feel free to let me know i'm, I'm happy to talk Yeah. I'm sorry, I was muted. No worries, so it's fine. Basically, uh, we'll leave out a framework at the end. So we'll take questions through emails and comments and we'll forward it to Dr. Harrington. So Perfect. they will be addressed, don't worry about that. Um, moving on. So the topic of our discussion for this episode would be uh, surrounded regarding the transitions to renewable energy how it has been a center of international communal thought, communities thought on climate change, the importance of it, and SD, SDGs, and how these just transitions are really important to take into consideration while moving towards low emission energies. So first of all, uh, I'd like uh, Dr. Harrington to give a small introduction on the framework surrounding the uh, transitions to renewable energy, how it has been in the focus of the international community throughout history, but how it has started taking shape recently. Absolutely. And, and thank you, because it really is quite a, an evolving cycle. And it's actually started to evolve quite quickly recently, which is very good. Um, but it does help to have some background in this. So um, from the 1970s onwards, the international community and <clears throat> multiple national communities really understood that we were seeing changes in the environment. We were seeing changes in public health. We were seeing all sorts of various outbreaks of diseases, uh, contaminated water causing cancer outbreaks, et cetera. And we also started to feel that there were impacts on the planet. Things started to change, warming, et cetera. And this gave a lot of scientists pause and they really started to look into it. And from that point on, there was about a 20 year period of discussion between scientists who had data lawyers who believed that this was a real problem, policymakers who believed the same thing, who at the time were very much in the minority. And as understanding started to build, as scientific technology started to build, there certainly became much more of an awareness of the intersections that exist between the need to regulate climate and climate impacts, uh, as well as the need to just prove that they exist. Um, by the early 1990s, we saw enough information and enough, certainly, anecdotal information that the public could understand um, that we had a major international conference, which was convened in Rio, um, in Brazil, and ultimately gave us several different environmental treaties. It gave us um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, it gave us the Convention on Desertification and Drought, and most importantly for this discussion, it gave us the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which um, is very widely adopted, is adopted by most states in the world, certainly India has adopted it and has always been a very proud uh, member of the system, as have a number of other countries, but India, I have to say, has always done really quite a good job of, of being a champion for it. Um, the framework convention itself is very much as the name suggests a set of ideas a set of understandings and the authorization of things like a conference of the parties on a yearly basis which many of you will have heard of in the reference to cop 
Uh, and so COP26 in Glasgow, COP25 in Madrid, COP24 in Katowice in Poland, et cetera, um, which is where all the, the countries that have signed on come together every year to talk about changes that need to happen. Um, at the time, there was an understanding of the importance of environment, the idea of transitioning and transitioning away from energy sources that were very much polluting was also coming to a lot of prominence, especially in places like the US. So it wasn't as much an explicit understanding as really implicit in a lot of the documents that came out of this. And the first place that we see this understanding is actually in the Kyoto Protocol, which was adopted in 1997. Um, the Kyoto Protocol created what, for those of you who are familiar with the EU uh, ETS, the, the emissions trading system, um, what that is. So it created in, uh, in the Kyoto terms, the system for how we could have an emissions trading system, be it national or regional or international, that wouldn't violate WTO laws, that wouldn't violate other types of laws, but that would be created with the idea of trying to reduce carbon emissions, most typically by trying to reduce um, dirty energy or just energy use in general, energy consumption, um, and the reward being a credit that could then go onto a market. And so we had a very market mechanism based system. Um, much of that still continues on. However, the technical expiration date of the Kyoto Protocol has passed, and it passed in the early uh, 2010s. When that happened, we were for several years without a follow-up. And the follow-up that many of you may be aware of is the Paris Agreement, which was adopted in 2015, um, conveniently and actually quite tellingly, the same year and uh, several months after the Sustainable Development Goals. So there's a really interesting link there. But um, the terms of the Paris Agreement are, are very much explicit about the need to have market and non-market mechanisms and the need to transition away from traditional sources of energy, the understanding that um, the situation at the global level is quite dire scientifically, and that the way we have kind of in various push and pull uh, scenarios tried to transition away from much of what we have as traditional energy sources hasn't worked and hasn't worked sufficiently to meet the needs of the scientific authorities and experts. Um, and so as legal experts, we've really tried to come in and figure out how do we bridge this? So we do see now this really kind of interesting transition from an open framework in the UNFCCC now to Paris. And then the subsequent years from Paris, the various meetings of the parties, conferences of the parties have given us even more nuanced understandings and a, a, the ability to see from policy perspectives how these types of laws are becoming put in place and what we need to do in the future. So. That is a very quick overview of a lot of history, um, but it, it is quite fascinating. And uh, it you know, really has shown us kind of what a, a global community can do when we understand that there are really common issues that are going to face us all, although in many different ways. Um, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> it does, it does. Um, that was a very long, but at the same time, very well nuanced description of the <laughs> Uh, legal framework in place. Uh, I particularly had a question regarding the policy aspect of it, the issue where the thought of the scientists who have proper evidence suggesting the requirement to shift to uh, low emission generation mm -hmm. methods and the policy makers who often, mo like uh, we did talk about how the policy makers were usually in the minority. So sure, this has shifted, but at the same time, often policymakers who do not believe in climate change at all come into power. And this was highlight, highlighted by US withdrawing out of Paris Convention altogether. Absolutely. Even though they did join back, I, I had a question regarding this. Does politi politicization of issues such as climate change have an effect on the implementation, the execution, and you know the subsequent uh, empowerment through, this, through these conventions? It does have to have a significant effect on it, right? If a yeah. party like US withdraws from it. Oh, absolutely. And it, honestly, because of the, the way that every country will be impacted in some way by climate change or already is, 
the withdrawal of any or threatened withdrawal of any country would have an impact. Um, the US was quite sensational and the way it was done and the arguments over when it would be effective and all of these very protracted, painful things that as um, a dual national of the US and the UK were, were really hard for me personally. Um, but when, you know, when that was happening, it did get a lot of attention. And in some ways it actually took away from what would happen if a smaller state with a lot more impact would, would leave, that would be quite damaging as well. Um, what really caused a lot of problems in, in the idea of leaving and the idea of either leaving entirely or having a regime come into power that perhaps doesn't prioritize uh, climate as much so we don't have full reporting because there is, especially under Paris, um, a re requirement for nationally determined contribution reportings every five years, um, or the, the reports that we get are not really that positive, is that we miss the benchmarking opportunities and then that starts to create a very um, dangerous slope of a state that is perhaps a developing state and with limited financial capacity, especially after COVID or during COVID, looking at other states and going, well, this one isn't complying, why should I comply? And it really does create quite a dangerous dynamic. Um, the efforts of international law have been to really say that we are creating systems where we must respect sovereignty, we must respect the choices of people and the leaders that they elect, but at the same time, because there have been choices by pre previous administrations to join these regimes, um, there still are legal obligations. And especially under the Paris Agreement system, having um, a compliance committee is actually a really interesting way to do this because it's a, a way of balancing state questions about other states' conduct with the idea of respecting sovereignty. And so the compliance committee will issue findings. It now is operationalized. It will issue findings about whether a particular state, so the US, for example, may be in compliance, but it will issue them in a way that isn't what we would usually teach law students about reading a case where the case is you know, very much, you are guilty, you are not guilty, and then this is your punishment and you must do this. Um, it is very much a holistic sense of you are not meeting your commitments. Um, here's how, here's how you might remedy it. And basically what can we take from the, uh, the gaps in enforcement in one entity that can be useful as a lesson for others. So it's this really fascinating way of trying to be between what is in the treaty and enforce that. And then what is you know, regarded as kind of sacrosanct, which is uh, sovereignty in international law. But it absolutely is an issue that is very much politicized. It continues to be, and we that's why we really do see a lot of frustration in the part of many people who look at international law and say, you know, well, you're not doing what you're saying you should be doing, and this is why, because it does become so political. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I also pretty much noticed that the, when there is a case or a situation that has arisen, which requires action from the international community, it is often, more than often, if not, a diplomatic so, sort of solution, not a direct you're guilty or not guilty, but rather exactly. like a soft push that, oh, you're doing this wrong and you need to fix it. Fix yeah. it in your own sovereign capabilities rather than, you know, us making you do it. No, absolutely. And so that is part of the compliance committee idea is, you know, we'll say that you're doing something wrong, but we will do it in a way that is soft enough to give you latitude in terms of how do you enforce it. The other thing that we're actually coming on next year already, I can't believe it's already going to be this in 2023, but um, is a global stock take of how everyone is implementing their requirements under the Paris Agreement. There are similar efforts periodically to do this with the Sustainable Development Goals as well. Um, in, in under their own regime. But in both systems, uh, the, there's this idea that we will take a global look to see how are we as a, an international community that's comprised of multiple sovereigns meeting these requirements and how are we failing in certain ways or how are we succeeding? So that actually is quite useful as a soft law instrument because what we're anticipating coming from this is a whole series of, of lessons that 
will typically not point fingers um, unless it's probably for something that's quite good, quite beneficial, but will give us a sense of a lot of you aren't doing this, so you need to do this. Um, or we need to move along in certain areas. And uh, it is a bit easier to do that in the context of the Paris Agreement because it is a legally binding agreement. The Sustainable Development Goals, by contrast, are, are not, they are highly persuasive, but they're not legally binding. So it does become a bit more difficult. Um, but we do have those mechanisms in place. They often don't feel the most satisfactory if you are used to having a case telling you you have to do this and that's it and you're guilty um but they they really actually can be quite powerful um and when you're inside that that world long enough you do start to understand the nuances of them and they are quite useful um yeah and uh i wanted to get some more uh knowledge on this specifically when we were talking about the standard uh, glo uh the global uh set of standards that we're going to move to next year yeah. so i wanted to know uh, the parameters that uh, contribute to the yeah. calculation of sorts to determine whether a certain uh, country or a state is meeting its compliances or not so the Absolutely. basic set of parameters that are taken yeah. into consideration so at the beginning of the paris agreement so either late 2015, 2016, some even into 17, um, most countries, with the exception of a very few developing states that really didn't have the resources at the time, were asked to do what we called an INDC, so an Intended Nationally Determined Contribution, which was the first benchmark of we're going to do this over the next several years. And then the vast majority of them, either in 2020 or 2021, filed kind of an update to say it's been several years and this is where we are in our progress. So we've used those so far as the benchmark. Um, and for 2023, what the international community will do, especially with those who are involved um, with the leadership of the Secretariat and the various committees within the UN Framework Convention System will do is they will take all of the filings that they have received and look at them and say, for example, for a state like the United Kingdom, this was your initial benchmark, this is where you progressed, this is your latest filing, this is where you are, and basically hold the state accountable, first and foremost, to its own standards and to the standards that it is set as a matter of its national law and policy to meet its international requirements. After that, we'll look and see basically how are these working against the Paris Agreement. So not only what you think you've agreed to and what you've signed on to is your own law, but what is international law saying and are you meeting these requirements or not? Um, so there will be some type of indicative reporting for each state, but then the, the very big stock take that you'll see will be a holistic understanding of all 193 countries and how are they working and what are they doing, which well, I'm sure not be light reading, um, but it will say, you know, this is so what everyone is doing. These are the areas that we as a global community are failing in. Um, so if you're doing research, especially if you're a student or if you're coming into the policy realm, it's very important to look at your country or whatever countries you may be focusing on if you focus on a region, as well as the international. Um, because that will give a really good understanding of what's going on on the ground and then what's going on at a high level. Um, because we often do make that mistake and we only go for the high level and then we assume that is it's being applicable followed to all the way down. Yeah. Exactly. And sometimes it's not. And actually, what is quite fascinating is that the Paris Agreement has recognized this in a way by placing um, a great deal of stress, and especially at the last COP in, uh, in Glasgow on sub-state units, so on provinces, on actually municipal governments, et cetera, as having, in many cases, a bit more latitude and a bit more agency to put in place various types of um, environmental and especially climate change laws and rules if their national government isn't willing to. Um, certainly in the US case, this is true, where we've had a number of national governments that don't want or can't get through the congressional process various types of climate legislation, but we have states like New York and California, which are very proactive in the climate sphere because they do have that ability under the national constitution system. So that is something else to look out for um, when we're looking at the stock take is what, what's going on below the national level. Um, 
and many of you may also know that in your own communities, in, in your cities, in your towns, um, effort, any extra efforts like that are, are often more important in some ways. And like, uh, rather than focusing on a global perspective, it has always seen like approaching it from a grassroots uh, way has always been more uh, successful, I guess. Uh, and even when you're applying legislations or creating regulations specifically for your own small area, state, province, then like you're focusing on a very tiny subset of uh, variables, which may be very different and there can't really be a uniform applicability for it, right? So oh, absolutely. That's, that's a very good view on that. The yeah, no, it, it really is. Um, and, you know, and certainly it's interesting because everyone will have a take on uh, loss and damage, for example, but it will be very different. And it does show how the international regimes that we have are meant to be very malleable. And that while we think of them as binding laws, we also need to remember they set standards, but those standards have to be interpreted very much at local levels on the ground because you know, some wonderful sounding standard that has no practical use it looks very pretty, but that's it. No practical use, yeah. Um, None. But yeah. I wanted to move forward with this and yeah. uh, with the Paris Convention in place and you did mention how coincidentally somewhat SDGs yes. also came into uh, effect in mm -hmm. that year itself. So I wanted to talk about how the SDGs provide for transitions here to uh, the less uh, emissions power generation methods and Particularly, I wanted to I wanted you to talk about how these transitionary uh, regulations do not really address for certain issues which you have enumerated upon in your blog post as well. So, absolutely, a short take on that. Of course, thank you. So, um, two thousand and fifteen was a very big year, and the Millennium Development Goals expired in that year. Now, many of you, if you're students, you'll be quite young to remember the Millennium Development Goals, but they came in in 2000 with the new millennium and they were quite broad. They were quite vague in many ways. Um, there were eight, a set of eight goals and eight kind of ideas as to what the biggest space, problems facing the international community were in the new millennium. And they were given a lifespan of 15 years to be addressed. As you may imagine, things like eradicating global hunger and poverty did not happen in 15 years, which is perhaps not a surprise to any of us. Um, so at the end of the 15 years, the decision was taken to have the Sustainable Development Goals as the next chapter. And so the next chapter for the next 15 years. There are still some very aspirational elements that most likely will not be met, especially with COVID, um, but they are much broader in the sense that there are 17 goals, there are 169 um, targets. So each goal has its own set of targets and overall there are 169 of them. There are indicators below that, like hundreds of indicators for how we look largely scientifically. So not as much from a policy perspective, but largely from a quantifiable perspective. How do we measure things like poverty reduction or um, gender inclusion, things like that. And the idea was that we would do this and yes, it will only be for 15 years. We don't know what will happen after, but this will give us a much better understanding of what the world needs to do to continue on towards a more sustainable future. And also how we ourselves identify and implement benchmarks at the national levels too. Um, one of the areas that we most often associate with the idea of transitioning um, is in goal eight, because that relates to labor and working and ensuring things like uh, decent livelihoods and decent wages, et cetera. Um, but we really do have to look beyond that. And this is one of the points that was brought out in the blog. We see in article seven or um, goal seven, this idea of having renewable energy and renewable resources being used as a critical element of the SDGs. We also have three SDGs that relate to, uh, to climate, so 
13 is climate change generally, and then 14 and 15 are life on land and life below water. So we look at all aspects of marine resources as well as terrestrial resources. And many of those are now being included in ideas of where are we going to get energy and how are we going to shift to renewables, be it floating wind farms, be it um, onshore wind farms or any other form of, of energy that we try to switch to. And we've obviously seen in the past several months a great deal of emphasis on very much accelerating a lot of the renewables um, that are at least potentially viable right now because of things like the Ukrainian hostilities and efforts to shift away from Russian oil and Russian gas. Um, at the same time, we do also see, perhaps less obviously, but we do see the idea of countering transitions and the impacts that transitions will have on workers, on communities, on families, et cetera, through almost every one of the SDGs. So if we think about poverty, education in particular, um, because there is a, a term in the SDGs that requires lifelong learning and that requires states to offer lifelong learning. And this may sound lovely and it may sound like something to do in your retirement, but it also means that if you are in a position where you work in the coal mining sector and that's no longer going to be viable, the state will then be faced with the requirement to retrain you somehow so that you can have another job that is a commensurate level and not just you know, be put on unemployment and then find whatever you can. Um, so there are a number of different intersections working throughout the SDGs. And from a policy perspective, many of them often are ignored. Um, and again, this is a point in the blog was that many of them are ignored, especially the idea of the intersections with infrastructure. Um, so we see a number of the SDGs focusing on infrastructure and on the need to make it sustainable, on the need to make it um, environmentally friendly, and on the need to make it socially responsible and make sure that we are not building infrastructure on the backs of human rights violations. But what we don't often see is a discussion about what infrastructures mean in just transitions, for example, or in the transition away from traditional forms of energy into new forms of energy, because there will necessarily be an entire shift in the infrastructure sector. But most of our discussions don't get into that. And it really is quite an open question for states like India, for states like the US, um, any of the European states, essentially any state that will be transitioning um, and most well, will be faced with that type of issue. And it's it, it's something that I find fascinating. I also find things strangely fascinating, but that is that is why I've chose to be a law scholar. But, um, but it is something that many of you may be faced with in the future, especially those who are starting out in your legal careers, because what we know of energy now and that market will change. And as it changes, we need to always remember that what accompanies energy will change. And there are unseen and unforeseen costs of that. And leaving that out is often quite damaging. So the SDGs do a very good job of kind of summarizing everything that uh, that comes into play with transitions. And uh, the particular thing you mentioned about it being variable, and I've, all, I've always noticed this whenever any friend who is not studying law, they'd ask me about, okay, if there is this issue, what will be the answer? How, how will the court decide? And I've noticed it's always based on variables and every law yep. student mm -hmm. practitioner will say, it depends. We don't know, mm -hmm. we, it depends on the facts. It can't be determined free, uh, pre, pre hand or something. So yeah, e even with regards to this, it will, I guess, depend yep. on the way the energy sector develops and how the technology changes. Absolutely. And, and we see things like um, the idea of shifting to things like uh, gray or green or blue or hydrogen, which everyone thinks, OK, we're switching to hydrogen. The intent is only to switch for a very short period of time until we have something else that we can then switch on to. Um, so, again, it becomes very variable. But then if we're talking about uh, solar energy, that's something that we intend to just keep refining into the future and always use. So it is very important to really think about renewables and think about new energy sources as really their own identities rather than just 
renewables. Mm, yeah. But I'm glad I... that you have learned this horrible fact of studying <laughs> and practicing law, which is that, you know, you can never give a yes, definitely this, no. <laughs> you always have to be diplomatic regarding it. You can't give a definite answer. But, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, so moving on, uh, specifically on this, even though I did want to touch upon the EU framework, the way they have developed yeah. it, I wanted to look at it in a comparative way, how India yes. can somewhat, I, I'm fairly sure it can't be emulated because the variables are very different. The reliance on the uh, high emissions energy sector is much higher in yeah. India. But I wanted to uh, ask you how the EU framework has been successful, but at the same time, how countries like India where uh, the focus, I had some numbers ready for this, where the, fo where the reliance on energy supplies like uh, fossil fuels is exceptionally high, where it's 70% in India and 44% is coal and uh, the, rest of us, the rest of it is 25. And what's even more con uh, bothering is the dependence of a few communities and districts and you know, provinces specifically being dependent on the uh, functioning of these high emission industries, such as the district of Urba, which accounts for 20% of India's coal production and uh, the mining industry contributes nearly 50% of the district's GDP. So when we do shift from uh, uh, the coal mining industry and eventually decide, ki, oh, we can't rely on this and we need to move to a low emission one, how do districts like Urba which have a heavy reliance on these historically uh, prevalent uh, forms of generating energy, how will they transition and what, what all should the government keep in mind while forming legal and regulatory policies and frameworks for this? That is such an amazing question. Thank you. It really is. Um, and I think just to get into that, and we can use some, some European examples perhaps to, to kind of illustrate, but... Um, what I found in doing consulting work and research work with various areas, especially the ones that I work with in Poland, uh, which often have very similar uh, identity structures where they, they really are focused on coal and it's what they've done, they're the regions that produce it, that's what they associate themselves with, et cetera. The efforts that we saw early on to just come in and say, we're closing mines, that's it, we'll, you know, we'll pay you, especially for older workers, um, we'll pay you, you're relatively close to retiring, we'll pay you a severance package, and that's it, um, didn't work well. And they didn't work well for a number of reasons. Not only because people were losing their jobs, not only because there was a sense of insecurity, but also because the reality of what was going on really wasn't being taken into account. So yes, we know that areas have, uh, have a very strong tie to coal mining and we can come in with ideas about, we'll give you other employment. But what is most, I think critical is that when a government, be it a local government or a national government, tries to find a fix and tries to find a way to transition, um, they look at what really is going on in the community. So often coal mining communities are historic communities. They have been doing this for several generations. Often the families in the communities kind of base their own identity on being part of the coal mining community. Uh, you will have, for example, sometimes a set pattern of social relations. So in the Polish example, women would typically stay at home. Their role is to raise the children. The husbands went to work in the coal mines, they were very much proud of that work because it was with their hands. It was very hard work and they felt like that gave them a different place in, in society. And then their children would grow up and they would follow the same dichotomy. And the packages that were given, the economic packages only took care of money for a short period of time. The training was minimal, it was there, but it was minimal and only for like industries. So only for working in energy, but in another sector, not potentially for training for something else, or only for working in something very similar like um, construction, where again, the potential was great that this job may go away. And the families were left out. So the women were left out, the children were left out, um, the, the communities themselves were completely left out and the focus was only on, on the one worker. And 
this did not work well. And it created a lot of enmity and it created a lot of really tough resistance. So I think when we're looking at any of the states in India that do have this really strong connection, we need to think about what makes the community, what makes the state. And how does that relate to coal rather than just, okay, we're going to catch the coal mines, you need a job, we're giving you this job, um, or we're training you for this job. Because when we think about our own lives, anytime I talk to people who are political leaders or anyone, I just always say, you know, put it in your own perspective. What makes us who we are is our identity. And a lot of that has to do with what we do. It, where we do it, etc. And if someone were to take that away, it, it becomes very much a personal issue beyond just trying to put food on the table. So when we think about transitions in that way, and then we start to build on that and have a larger understanding of the community, that will then build community will. And when you have community will, it's a lot easier as a government, as a leader, or as a policymaker or analyst, to then create policies because you can have a dynamic conversation with people to understand what they actually need. So the laws work. And when the laws work, then there's more trust. And so it's a kind of ever evolving bridge. Um, obviously we also do need to have industry involved in these discussions and it can't just be a governmental discussion. It really needs to be people and also industry and figure out what is going to happen to the industries that are closing? What industries are we bringing in and how are we doing that? How do we support new entrepreneurs who may have great ideas? Um, and actually often sites, especially um, again in the Polish example, sites that have been used for mining have then been turned into new facilities that support all sorts of renewable energy because they're, again, they're in kind of often rural areas or areas that are not as close to cities, it's better to have wind farms, it's better to have different types of uh, energy production. So we see that that's worked quite well. Um, but what we really need to do is understand what goes into the, any industry, coal in particular, but any industry that's being transitioned away from. And then also remember that those industries that we come to rely on for the future will also transition, they will also change. And that when we create laws and we create rules, we need to think about them as evolutionary rather than fixed in time, that's it, this is the only rule we will ever need for anything because we know that it doesn't work. Um, and then we have to change it and then it becomes a very often miserable and contentious issue. Um, so if we just think about it that way, which is humbling in a way because you realize you're not making the end of whatever that regulatory system might be. But if you can think about it that way, it does really help um, to create something that is meaningful. And that's what a lot of the Green Deal, I think, is trying to do from the EU example, because the EU is so complex and India is quite complex as well. And many of the complexities are different, but they are still there in the sense that you have much more developed regions and then much more underdeveloped regions and trying to create policies that bridge all of them can be really hard. So for example, what the EU has done is it has the Green Deal, it has the directives, but it also has a number of strategies and communications. So not as binding ways of saying, we need to work on blue energy, we need to work on um, methane, et cetera, that gives at least a little bit of leeway to the states so that they can tailor their own policies. They're still evaluated. They still are subject to heavy reporting guidelines um, and produce some truly wonderful pre-bedtime reading if you need to fall asleep reports. However, they are also quite important and, um, and they tell you what's going on and there is an evaluation, but it's done in a, a more kind of context dependent way. And I think that type of lesson can be taken from the EU very easily. Um, because it's much more pragmatic. Um, yeah. So finally, uh, to address how the transitions work, uh, I did find five specific uh, parameters or the mm -hmm. goals that a state should keep in mind while you know developing the policy. And you seem to have addressed all of them wherein the uh, infrastructure and land is being repurposed, the workers, the workforce is being reskilled and skilled in new uh, fields. There is revenue substitution and responsible social and environmental practices. One thing I wanted to touch 
wanted you to touch upon was the economic effect on it. Like at the end of the day, even the state relies on the taxation and all the benefits it accrues from the ex existing of the previous industries, right? And it where and in most of the case, most of the cases, it's usually the case where uh, the government or the state is kind of supporting the newly set up low emission industries. So that's where they take a loss as well, right? So could you touch exactly. upon it? No, definitely. And, you know, and we often tend to think, and, and lawyers do this too, which is amusing, but we often tend to think of a state or even you know, a, a province or a state, a sub national state as just it, it's there it serves a function it you know it gives you economic and social support etc but we don't tend to think about how it gets that support we just assume it's coming um and that is one of the problems and we've seen this we've seen this in australia especially where there were some uh, states that really just needed mining and that's what they're dependent on and that's why we still have a lot of issues there today with trying to decouple from mining um it is a very hard problem, and it is a problem that needs to be addressed with preferably some national support to provide funding and assistance um, and carefully tailored support to new industries. So what we've seen not work in the past is where there's been a blanket kind of tax exemption for renewables, for example. And that's wonderful. And certainly it brings people in, but when they start to become profitable, then that's a problem for the state, which may have granted in perpetuity or for a very long period of time, 50 years, 60 years, a tax break that then winds up causing them to lose a great deal of money at the same time that they're losing the economic benefit of mining from which they had a huge tax base. So what really does need to happen is the incentives and the policies that are created for bringing in new industries need to be kind of short term in a way and reliable in the sense of setting up for a, a longer term presence but tax breaks for 10 years then we reevaluate um land breaks or land deals or things like that for a short period of time and then we reevaluate so that if things start going very well they will start paying back to the state and giving state revenue if they don't, and there's a need to make, perhaps encourage some other industry to come in, then the state would also have the ability to do that. And it would make sense for the industry to leave because their tax credit or tax preference is up after 10 years, rather than saying, hmm, we're not making a lot of money, but we don't have to pay taxes. So we could just stay here for a while, which, you know, especially if you have investors can make a great deal of sense, but doesn't work for the state. Um, and that's where you really have to look at these issues proactively and very carefully. And it's often hard, no matter the country, because we tend to have a lot of very reactive laws and legislation. And something will happen and then there will be a reaction and the reaction gives us new law. But that's very dangerous in many contexts, but certainly in the, the transition and the energy context, it's extremely dangerous because it's almost setting up in some ways whatever responses we have to fail because they're not well planned out. Um, but at the end of the day, wouldn't these reactionary uh, develop, this reactionary development of law, depending upon the state of the economy, the society, to make laws that are dynamic in nature to like, you know, keep evolving them according to the developments, wouldn't that be necessary from that point of view? Oh, it, it is necessary to have that. Absolutely, it's also always necessary to have some reactivity, but we also need to remember that we need to have laws that are well planned out. And so certainly we always need to be able to respond to some unforeseen pressure, COVID, for example, right? We, we needed to have reactionary laws for COVID, but we need to make sure that those aren't our only ways of thinking about problems that we know we have. Um, and obviously we can't foresee what the next great problem will be, and hopefully we won't have one for a very long time. But uh, we do need to keep that open. But when we know that there are issues coming, it's really important and incumbent upon us as lawyers to think about them kind of before they come to the fore, before they become the next crisis. So we can avoid that crisis mentality. So we basically stay prepared for the worst, right? Like if anything can happen, we just prepare to put force majeure on it or somehow give some uh, relaxations to the parties involved. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, so yeah, uh, the final question I had was actually it's a two part one. So regarding the COP26 and the events that unfolded after that, the Ukraine conflict. So mm -hmm. the decoupling from the uh, Russian energy sources, I'm fairly sure that the impact would be very huge, right? Because European reliance on Russian oil and energy is quite high. So how is that a good thing uh, from the point of view that Europe will, at the end of the day, try to become more self-sustainable and yeah. looking at the trajectory it's going in, most of the energy would be going through low emission uh, mm -hmm. generation methods. But at the same time, you did address how it can be problematic as well for the yeah. uh, international community. So firstly, yeah. this. And uh, the second thing was, what can be the key takeaways from this issue and how these legal transitional uh, frameworks and regulations need to be developed so that they provide for all the issues that are being overlooked right now. Absolutely. Definitely. Thank you. These are fantastic questions. I Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, so I, I think obviously there will be a European benefit in the sense that what it is currently ob obliged to do, what member states in the EU are currently obliged to do under the Green Deal, under the new climate law, under their own national laws and rules will be happening and will be happening in a way that perhaps would have been pushed back because of COVID. I do know that in some uh, instances, European Union states were pushing back against their own commitments by saying in, up until early this year, by saying that they had the unanticipated impact of COVID and they couldn't meet them. And now obviously they can't basically afford to or politically can't um, keep the reliance on oil and gas coming from Russia. So they will have to transition. It is currently summer. And so happen, having this happen in summer is one thing. The impacts and the real negativity that we will probably see will come in winter when it gets very cold, when it is very difficult uh, to sustain yourself without a lot of energy in any part of Northern Europe. And in the UK, I should mention that since I'm looking forward to freezing as well. And between the cost being prohibitive for many people and also the accessibility issues, I would anticipate that this will probably be the biggest uh, negative and the biggest challenge. And in the immediate, it may be a bit painful. Um, in the long term, this pain will then ultimately result in finding new ways to address it. But it, it will certainly politically be a very questionable time, I think, for a lot of leaders. Because when we look at what the, the populist response is to being cold or to having to pay a lot or uh, choose between food and heat, this may become quite overwhelming and it could have a negative backlash on the overall idea of transitioning energy away. Um, and certainly we've seen that in many countries in the, the EU as well as the UK, where there are people questioning, why do we need to do this if it's and military activity that's happening in Ukraine, why do we need to do this and incur the cost here? So I think we may see that in the short term, much more um, loudly said, but then I think in the long term, it will transition into something that's quite useful. Um, in terms of what do we take from this? I think we take the idea that first of all, we can use international law as a very strong framework to move nations and to move sub nations in areas that they might not otherwise move in um, and sometimes give them the, the bad actor is the wrong way to say it, but I guess it really is, give them the, the person to blame, right? We can blame having to comply with the Paris Agreement. We can blame you know, needing to comply with the SDGs so that we can get grant money, et cetera. Um, even when it's not politically popular so that things will happen. Even if you agree with them as a political leader, it still can be a very useful tool. Uh, so I think that's number one. And I think number two, what we really need to understand is that we have spoken for so long about transitions in the energy sector and those linked to climate and environment. But what we're now seeing is, especially post COVID, a broader understanding of transitions and we're seeing multiple industries. So especially the tourism industry, for example, which many countries depended on. Um, and that was their, their, their source of revenue and it was a source of their revenue years ahead of planning. 
very quickly become unimaginably hindered. Um, so that now a lot of jobs are not coming back. A lot of people are choosing not to go back to those sectors. A lot of hotels and restaurants are questioning whether they open up. And then that is another type of transition. Um, when we think about healthcare, we think about a lot of different areas. They've all been very heavily affected. So the ideas that we have of transitions and the need to address the, the root issues in them to solve them are very powerful coming out of the energy sector. But I think what we really need to take away is that this can be used in many other sectors and in the future. And it's something we can use now. It might look different in 10 years, but it's still an idea that we can use into the future to frame law and to frame policy that is responsive enough to really do its job rather than just be a piece of paper at the end of the day to torment our, our future law students with and make you all learn. <laughs> it's always the soft law that's the hardest to enforce, right? I mean, oh, it is. if it was it is. a hard force law, which just goes, yep, you're wrong. There's no consideration. You, it could have been much simpler then. Like, you know, it, it, that is position. easy. <laughs> this is why everyone looks at me like, oh, but so much of international law isn't hard law. You know, it's not real law. Yes, it is. It's just harder to enforce. <laughs> but it's, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. I do not really have any more questions, but the people who are watching this, eventually who will watch this, feel free to drop please. any of your questions in the comments please. and you can mail them uh, at the mail ID that is going to be mentioned there. Uh, I Perfect. think it's IJPIEL podcast at gmail.com, but okay. please do verify. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for coming, uh, Dr. Harrington. Thank you. thank you for making time. It was a really interesting conversation. I would say I was looking forward to it and like it exceeded all my expectations. I'm so glad. I'm really glad to have had this session. Uh, do you want to close it off? I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the audience members. Thank you to the journal. And thank you in particular, because it's been a wonderful conversation. I could go on for hours and just have a conversation about this. Um, but really, thank you so much for this opportunity and for your enthusiasm. I greatly appreciate it. Um, but yeah, this, this was a great call. And uh, I guess I'll stop recording. Okay. That should be enough. For